First off, our rant. The Amazon River in South America is the largest river by discharge in the world, with seven and a half million cubic feet flowing through it per second. Seven and a half million cubic feet of discharge. That's why you come to the dog anyways. But even the powerful flow of the Amazon can switch directions. Millions of years ago, the Amazon flowed in the opposite direction it does today. Much like the reversal of the Amazon, trends can completely invert despite how permanent they may seem. As we know, COVID is an impetus for major change. One major reversal incited by the pandemic is the newfound disadvantage to living in cities. People have been flocking to cities for the past 30 years. Urban crime has been decreasing since the 80s. Cities have been the hottest places for economic and social opportunity. Today, approximately 83% of Americans live in cities, up from 64% in 1950. But COVID overnight has turned density from a feature into a bug. The river has reversed. 39% of US urban dwellers said the COVID crisis has prompted them to consider leaving for a less crowded place. It's no surprise that the wealthy have been the ones who have been able to flee. Affluent neighborhoods, including Soho, the West Village, Morningside Heights, the Upper East Side, Gramercy, and Brooklyn Heights have emptied by more than 40% since the beginning of the shutdown. That's approximately equal to the percentage of New Yorkers that drink coffee every day. Think about that. Everyone who drinks coffee suddenly overnight vacates the island. If we assumed 40% vacate Manhattan neighborhoods, this would equate to removing approximately 600,000 people, more than the population of the state of Wyoming. Kind of a weak flex. I didn't know anyone lived in Wyoming. Anyways, side note, the state of Wyoming has less than 600,000 people, but two senators. And by the way, by the way, California with 40 million people also, let me think, Two senators, that makes sense. Anyways, people in cities are conducting 33 times the number of searches for new types of housing than people who don't live in cities. And outdoor space is now a key search term across all audiences. And some industries are less tethered to location than others. A recent survey of New York tech and finance workers found that 69% said they would leave New York permanently if they were given the option to work from home. Think about that. Two thirds of people in the city would leave if they were afforded the opportunity. So the conventional wisdom here, the first order is that Manhattan gets really hard. Yes, it might, but the singular cocktail of grit, culture, creativity, and glamor survives. In sum, New York, the city, is fabulous and will not be crushed. Its surrounding nondescript suburbs, whose primary value is or was proximity, absolutely crush. It's not that people who live in the city will leave, it's people that work in the city and live in a nearby suburb are gonna be the ones that leave. Manhattan is worth it. Short Hills, New Jersey and Greenwich, Connecticut, not so much. While some people who live in the city will leave, the real rush to the exits will be people who work in the city but live in a nondescript suburb. When people can work from anywhere, the continued winners will be low tax, high sunshine states, the most popular, Mail forwarding location outside of New York for Manhattan residents was Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, almost 2,000 mail forwarding requests and counting. Google searches for Florida public schools spiked in mid-March with a significant volume of searches from Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and any other place that's really cold with high taxes. Home prices in Greenwich, Connecticut, get this, are down 24% since last year. And this trend makes complete sense. Think about an individual family's choices. Mom, Tanya, works in law, raking in $600,000 a year. Go, Tanya, Tanya, equals player. Dad, Danny, works as a VP of marketing, making 300,000. Also a player, by the way, a lot of players, a lot of players in and around Manhattan. They are crushing it, both going into New York City, four to five times per week. They live in Greenwich, Connecticut with two kids, but now they can both work remote. And so Tanya and Danny begin noticing that high income tax and 40,000 per kid they spend on private school, plus all the commuting costs. Proximity to New York City now has little value. Tanya and Danny are about to give themselves a raise by moving to Boca Raton. What do they save? $54,000 in annual income tax, 13,000 on mortgage payments, 50,000 on tuition for their kids, and 100,000 on general spending, not to mention 
the weather. Therefore, in housing, schooling, spending, and income tax, Tanya and Danny save almost a quarter of a million dollars per year. And if they're hoping to buy real estate for the same $3 million they would have paid in Connecticut, they can get a mansion or a Mick mansion in Florida for half the price, immediately unlocking a million and a half dollars to invest in, say, I don't know, an unregulated monopoly like Amazon or Apple or Facebook or Google. Kaboom, Danny and Tanya, come to the sunshine, come to the dog. If you are Danny and Tanya, the financial upside is indisputable. There are astronomically large second order effects to the movement we will see here. One second order effect, politics. Show me a college educated New Yorker or someone in Montclair, New Jersey, or someone who has the resources to move from Greenwich, Connecticut to Delray Beach, and I'll show you a Democrat. Trump won Texas by 800,000 votes. Eight and a half million people live in New York City and 40% of them are considering leaving. It would only take 9% of Manhattanites to relocate in order to potentially go blue. It would take even less in Florida. Trump won by a margin of 112,000 votes. It would take less than 1% of Manhattanites to relocate in order to potentially go blue. We are looking at a massive migration of people in the near future. The reversal of a river is no small event.